For the past six months, a war has been going on within Sudan, which the Western media is calling a civil war. However, it's not a civil war because people and civilians are not fighting. Rather, the army and paramilitary are competing for power. However, during such a destruction that has cost over 9,000 lives until now, a question arises. This question is about who is financing the war in a country that could not feed its population. But for carrying a war, it has unlimited resources. That's what the de facto president and the army chief of Sudan hinted toward at the United Nations General Assembly. He said that Sudan knows external forces are playing in the war, and this can have a spillover effect, causing wars in the entire region. Where he was referring to and why the Western leaders were seen hiding their faces during the session. Let's know what more he said and exposed how the West is abusing the war. Let's get started. The de facto leader of Sudan has issued a stark warning to the UN, expressing deep concerns about the possibility of the country's ongoing conflict spilling over into neighboring African nations. During a recent address, General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan urged the international community to classify the Rapid Support Forces, which are his adversaries, as a terrorist group. Since April, Sudan has been engulfed in a devastating civil war, resulting in the loss of nearly 9,000 lives so far. The conflict, initially sparked by a power struggle between the two generals, has intensified, leading to lethal clashes between their respective factions. In his UN speech, General Burhan expressed his party's readiness to participate in peace negotiations, highlighting the urgent need to end the ongoing war and alleviate the suffering of the Sudanese people. But there is more to it. He let the world know why there was a conflict in the first place. He confessed that Sudan does have internal problems and conflicts which might have played a role in triggering the war. However, he said that the fact it has been prolonged hints toward external interferences. In other words, he implicitly said that even if a war was a possibility, the prolonging factor is surprising, given that Sudan's military and paramilitary cannot afford a war being fought for months. While advocating for the designation of the RSF as a terrorist organization, General Burhan stressed the necessity of accountability and retribution for the reported atrocities committed by the RSF, including killings, displacements, and human rights violations. Put simply, he deemed the RSF a terrorist organization which is being financed and supported by external forces. Being only a paramilitary group, the RSF could never have the capacity to confront and fight Sudan's military. However, it is fighting which points toward the fact that the Western powers are using Sudan as a proxy battlefield. Despite his efforts to garner international support, General Burhan has faced criticism for his role in the military actions during the conflict. The UN envoy to Sudan, Volker Perthes, strongly condemned both generals for their involvement in the conflict, holding the RSF responsible for sexual violence, looting, and killings, and censuring the Sudanese armed forces for indiscriminate aerial bombings. As a response, the US has imposed sanctions on RSF leaders, including General Dagalo, while expressing concerns about General Burhan's actions during the 2021 coup. During his address to the UN, General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan said, the ramifications of this conflict extend well beyond our borders, as these rebels are seeking support from outlawed groups and terrorists across various nations. He continued and said that this conflict could potentially ignite a much larger regional crisis, directly impacting global peace and stability. This simply means that General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan gave a clear message to the Western countries involved in the conflict. He said that if RSF continued fighting, which means if the West continued supporting RSF, the war could surpass borders and could potentially lead to the fragmentation of Sudan itself. Perhaps he should know that breaking Sudan once again can be on the Western agenda. Earlier, Sudan was broken and a new country called South Sudan was created. Now, after years of disintegration, Sudan is once again amid the same conflict, which can potentially break the country once again. Despite earlier claims of seeking a resolution and intermittent announcements of ceasefires, the conflict has persisted, exacerbating the already dire humanitarian crisis in Sudan. 
amid efforts by Saudi Arabia and the U.S. to establish a sustainable ceasefire in Sudan, the process has encountered obstacles, with parallel diplomatic initiatives in Africa and the Middle East further complicating the situation. But to understand what is going on, you have to first know the background. Situated in the northeastern part of Africa, Sudan ranks among the continent's largest countries, spanning a vast expanse of over 1.9 million square kilometers. However, despite its considerable size, Sudan faces the challenge of pervasive poverty, with its 46 million inhabitants grappling with an average annual income of $750 per person. Following the 2021 coup, Sudan has been under the governance of a council of generals, led by two central military figures entangled in an ongoing conflict. One is General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, serving as the head of the armed forces and de facto president of the country, while the other is General Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo, also known as Hamedti, who acts as his deputy and leads the RSF. Their discord primarily revolves around Sudan's future trajectory and the proposed shift towards civilian rule. Integral points of contention include the integration of the 100,000-strong RSF into the army and determining the leadership of the merged forces. Put simply, the entire conflict in Sudan seems to be a power struggle between two generals. However, it's not that simple because you have to know who is actually controlling the reins of one of these generals, exacerbating the conflict. The eruption of hostilities on April 15th stemmed from heightened tensions as RSF members were redeployed across the nation, perceived as a threat by the army. Despite expectations of de-escalation through dialogue, these discussions failed to materialize. The origin of the initial conflict remained a matter of dispute, with subsequent violence claiming the lives of thousands. While the conflict ostensibly centers on the control of vital installations, much of the turmoil has unfolded in urban areas, affecting civilians. The specific locations of RSF bases remain ambiguous, although it appears their fighters have moved into densely populated regions. The Sudanese Air Force has carried out airstrikes in the capital, home to over 6 million people, potentially resulting in civilian casualties. Despite several declared ceasefires to facilitate the evacuation of affected individuals, these agreements have not been honored. Formed in 2013, the RSF evolved from the notorious Janjaweed militia, notorious for its brutal activities in Darfur, with accusations of ethnic cleansing. General Dagalo has augmented the force's capabilities, engaging in interventions in Yemen and Libya, while also pursuing economic interests, including controlling some of Sudan's gold mines. The RSF has faced allegations of human rights abuses, notably the massacre of more than 120 protesters in June 2019. The presence of such a formidable force operating outside the traditional military framework has been viewed as a destabilizing element within the country. This conflict between the military and RSF represents the latest chapter in a series of tensions following the ousting of long-serving President Omar al-Bashir in 2019, who had seized power through a coup in 1989. Despite the formation of a joint military-civilian government, it was overthrown in another coup in October 2021, with General Burhan assuming control. Subsequent rivalry between General Borhan and General Dagalo has intensified, hindering efforts to finalize a framework for the restoration of civilian rule. General Dagalo's allegations characterizing General Borhan's government as radical Islamists have been met with skepticism, given the RSF's history of brutality. General Borhan has expressed his backing for a transition to civilian rule, but remains committed to quitting power exclusively to an elected government. Despite suspicions of his alleged ties to ex-President Bashir, a connection refuted by the military, suspicions persist that both generals are reluctant to surrender their positions of power, unwilling to forego the associated wealth and influence. Amid mounting concerns that the conflict could lead to further fragmentation and regional instability, diplomatic efforts have centered on facilitating dialogue between the two generals. While a regional coalition initially planned to dispatch three presidents to mediate in Khartoum, the mission never materialized. So far, the situation is terrible in Sudan. The clashes that began in Khartoum last April between the Sudan Armed Forces and the paramilitary Rapid Support Forces have twisted into a full-fledged civil war. 
General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, leading the SAF, and his former deputy, General Mohammed Hamdan Degallo of the RSF, had previously collaborated to overthrow the Bashir regime in 2019 and orchestrate a military coup in 2021. However, tensions surrounding the integration of the RSF into the SAF eventually fueled an escalation of violence over the past six months, trapping Sudanese civilians in an increasingly dire humanitarian crisis. Despite efforts from the international community to mediate, the lack of coordination and divergent regional interests have complicated the situation further. Currently, the conflict in Sudan has evolved into a complex struggle, playing out in various fragmented areas across the nation. The geographic spread of the civil war has resulted in violence extending beyond the direct control of the SF and RSF commands. Here's a reminder to please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on black culture, history, civilization, and identity. Let's continue now. The degree of external support received by the warring factions will heavily influence the trajectory of the conflict. Notably, the United Arab Emirates maintains a well-documented relationship with the RSF, while Egypt's historical ties with the SAF remain firmly rooted. Sudan's future now hangs in the balance as a tug-of-war ensues between foreign interests, seemingly undeterred by intermittent and largely ineffective international mediation efforts. At present, Khartoum is predominantly under the control of the RSF, with a few SAF strongholds remaining. The city's future hinges on the potential deployment of artillery or air power by the SAF to dislodge the RSF, which is currently employing civilians and civilian infrastructure as shields, inevitably resulting in significant human and material losses. Simultaneously, the SAF has consolidated its position in eastern Sudan, centered around Port Sudan along the Red Sea coast, essentially transforming Sudan into a Libya along the Red Sea. Those residing between eastern Sudan and Khartoum, as well as eastern Sudan and Darfur, find themselves abandoned, lacking basic necessities, and vulnerable to pressures from both sides. The SAF may be banking on the fatigue of the international community and a potential realignment of regional alliances that could bolster their claim to represent Sudan's legitimate government. While some militias in Sudan have managed to remain detached from the conflict, a few were signatories to the 2020 Juba Peace Agreement and recently convened in the Eritrean capital to assert their political stance. Significantly, the escalation of conflict in Darfur has emerged as a critical and distressing development in Sudan's war, with relentless violence largely attributed to the RSF, surpassing the atrocities committed by the Janjaweed, the RSF's forerunner, two decades ago. Despite several fragile ceasefires, Ongoing peace efforts reveal multiple and uncoordinated attempts to establish mediation structures. The lack of a unified approach has fostered an environment where warring parties sense a newfound sense of immunity. Various entities, including the African Union, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, Egypt, the United States, Saudi Arabia, and South Sudan, have attempted to facilitate peace talks, yet achieving a sustainable cessation of hostilities remains unattainable. Coordinating these initiatives while ensuring credible representation for Sudan's diverse militias and unarmed people is crucial for any long-lasting peace resolution and the construction of a constitutional future for the nation. As the humanitarian crisis in Sudan worsens, the primary focus for aiding civilians trapped in the conflict is to ensure they have access to the essentials for survival, food, shelter, medicine, and security. The scarcity of food stems from the shutdown of major transportation routes, with one faction controlling the nation's only port. Recent agricultural yields have been meager, and projections suggest a dire situation by November and December. Sudan's neighboring countries must open up their territories, roads, ports, and airports swiftly to facilitate the large-scale humanitarian efforts needed by the international community. Time is running short for necessary preparations. For urban populations like those in Khartoum, the inability to stockpile food in households, common in rural areas, has intensified the severity of the situation. Their survival now hinges on trade networks, bringing food from Egypt to local markets and the commendable efforts of Sudanese groups providing support and solidarity to their compatriots. Moreover, 
The soaring cost of food has made it unaffordable for many households, necessitating the provision of cash for purchasing essential supplies. The Nile, Sudan's lifeline, is also under substantial threat. Dams along the Sudanese Nile not only generate electricity and provide potable water, but also support irrigation. Prolonged conflict jeopardizes the integrity of Sudan's water and power supply, emphasizing the urgent need to safeguard supply routes, logistical hubs, and critical infrastructure, potentially necessitating the deployment of an external force. Meanwhile, the influx of Sudanese refugees into neighboring countries poses significant challenges for Egypt, South Sudan, and Chad. The growing support for the SAF and RSF, extending to the United Arab Emirates and beyond, indicates the potential infiltration of external interests in Sudan. These external influences, combined with the ongoing conflict, directly impact the security of the Red Sea, raising significant concerns. However, the important external force no one is talking about is the West. Even if the US, UAE, Egypt, and neighboring countries seem to be the main players, the Western countries remain hidden, controlling the reins secretly. The neighboring countries are trying to assist in a ceasefire. However, they must take into account that the West has bet on prolonging the war. Therefore, no peacemaking agreement will work until the external support to the fighting groups is cut off. This seems to be a problem because so far, despite being only a force of a few thousand, in comparison to Sudan's 200,000 active soldiers, the RSF has not budged from the war. This shows that the external involvement is more deep-rooted than we think. If the West is financing Sudan in war but it never did the same during times of need like ending hunger or poverty, it means that the war is profitable for the West. It's because this war is already nearly engulfing neighboring countries. South Sudan, which is heavily reliant on Sudan for its oil exports, faces the threat of disruptions should it appear to favor one side. Also, any disruption to the regular flow of the Nile waters in Sudan poses a direct threat to Egypt's economy and security. The fate of the Darfur communities is closely tied to the future of Chad, given their shared border. What's more, Saudi Arabia's substantial economic investments along the Red Sea coast make any security threat to the region a risk to these investments. The United Arab Emirates' close association with the RSF and related enterprises highlights the complexity of the external dynamics influencing Sudan's conflict. But how can this conflict end? Well, the answer is simple. To end the war, the warlords have to go bankrupt. It's because as long as they keep getting funds to finance the war, the conflict will never end. You will see here that the West will never end its funding. There have already been reports from the UK where several businesses were found funding the Sudan war indirectly. Who is behind these businesses? However, if the fund transfer is not seized, then there are three possibilities the war can end. First, a rapid military victory over RSF can end the war. However, the likelihood of a swift triumph on the battlefield seems improbable, considering that both sides possess distinct advantages that benefit them at different stages of the conflict. Essentially, what's unfolding is a split within the military junta, with each faction claiming initial successes. General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan leads the army and serves as the junta's president. On the other hand, General Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo, known as Hemeti, heads the paramilitary rapid support forces and holds the position of the junta's vice president. Accounts from those leaving the capital Khartoum indicate that the RSF holds a slight advantage within the city. Operating as a nimble guerrilla force, the RSF demonstrates a capacity for swift adaptation, giving them an edge during the ongoing clashes in Khartoum's urban hub. Nevertheless, the army is believed to have access to considerably more firepower, including tanks, artillery, and air supremacy. With diplomats and foreign nationals evacuating the city, there are concerns that this might soon be turned against Khartoum. In different areas of the city, the RSF has stationed fighters in residential neighborhoods, effectively seizing control of homes, explains Alan Boswell from the international crisis group Think Tank. It appears they are challenging the army to destroy its own capital, Although one might assume the army is hesitant to devastate Khartoum, this has become an existential battle for them. It's reported that the army enjoys full support from the regional powerhouse Egypt, despite the northern neighbor officially maintaining a neutral position. Contrarily, 
the RSF receives backing from the United Arab Emirates, Russia's Wagner mercenary group, and various other regional militias. Another possibility is a prolonged conflict, which now seems to be the reality. Experts have already concluded that the conflict seems to be on its way to becoming an extended civil war. Then there is a third possibility, which seems difficult here. Prospects for a peace accord. No doubt diplomats are working hard to convince the two generals to extend the ceasefire, but the prospects of initiating peace talks anytime soon appear dim. There's also the question of what the ordinary Sudanese would find acceptable. It seems unanimous that any agreement will only come about under external pressure. However, what if the most powerful of external forces, the West, wants to prolong the war? What do you think, is the West involved in the Sudan War? Isn't it true that to finance a costly war, Sudan's military and paramilitary need funds more than what's in the treasury? Let us know your thoughts on what Sudan should do to end the war. Do you want to watch more videos like this one? If yes, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon next to it. We have decided to bring videos on something nobody talks about. The black culture, civilization, history and evidence about how glorious blacks have been. Thanks for watching, and until the next video, stay tuned.